Mr. Baldwin. Hey, Miss Awad. Want to talk about plate tectonics? Thought you'd never ask. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Hey, and look at all these guys are joining us today. This will be fun. Hey, guys. Hi, you guys. What are we going to talk about? Well, today we're going to be talking about plate tectonics. And if you flip to the next slide, we should be able to see what you should be able to accomplish today. So by the end of the segment, you should be able to identify pieces of evidence that support Alfred Wegener's continental drift hypothesis. It means you can indicate or point out what something is. Okay, what kind of data are we gonna look at? Well, first things first, we're gonna look at a little bit of GIS. Now, Miss Awad, you're the GIS expert. Could you give us a hint as to what this is? Okay, so you guys are really gonna to wanna to take some notes here. So you might wanna write GIS in your notes, and you also might want to note down that GIS stands for Geographic Information System. GIS, Geographic Information System. Good to know. Now, this GIS, or Geographic Information System, looks like it's laid out similarly to Google Earth. Over on the right side, there's what we're going to call the map layer. And this is where in Google Earth, you'd have the map of the world that you could zoom in and zoom out, right? Absolutely. And over on the left side, you've got the layers list. So for taking notes, you probably want to maybe make a little bracket down here and say map layer. And on the left side, you want to say layers list. In the layers list is where all the data is. And we can see for this particular map that we're looking at fossil distribution data. Which fossils are we going to be looking at, Mr. Baldwin? Well, we're going to take a look at a fossil called Glossopteris. So we're going to draw little circles around all the green dots. So we've got a Glossopteris right in here in Australia. Hmm. And we've got a Glossopteris here up in India and in Madagascar and Africa. Now, Miss Awad, do you know what a Glossopteris is? You know, I think a Glossopteris is a plant, and I think it's similar to a fern. You're absolutely right. Now, here's a question I have for you, Miss Awad. Do we really find ferns in Antarctica? Is that something that grows there right now? I don't think so. I think it's too cold for ferns to grow there. What about South America, would you expect to find ferns growing there? I don't think so. There's not going to be any ferns in South America or Antarctica. Hmm. So why are we finding fossils of ferns in places like Antarctica, South America, even Africa? Well, Mr. Baldwin, before we answer that question, what do you think the students should write down in their notes on this section? Hmm. We should definitely be talking about the ferns and the distribution of where we're finding them. Because we find them, ferns, and fossils in different continents. Okay. Well, that's a good start. And also, we've got some other fossils up here. Now, the other three fossils happen to be animals. And if you think about them be, being like lizards or reptiles, again, the same question. Would you expect to find a lizard or a reptile living in Antarctica? Not at all. Okay. So that's going to kind of lead us to the question here. Explain the significance of the fossil data observed by Alfred Wegener. Hmm. Interesting. So I think we have a kind of a conundrum here. Yeah, because we're going to look at some more evidence, and we're going to start asking some questions about this same evidence. You're going to see some similarities. Now we turned on a new layer, we turned off the fossils, and now we've got on the glacial deposits. So these are rocks that are found in areas where glaciers typically are. Now see some glaciers right here in Africa. I've never been to Africa, but I know that I'm pretty sure there's not many glaciers there. I don't think there are any in Australia. I don't think there are glaciers in India. And I know there are some glaciers in South America, but I think they're more in the Andes Mountains on the west coast than they are over here in parts of Argentina. I would expect to find glaciers in Antarctica, but I don't see that Wegener had evidence of glaciers being in Antarctica. So these must be ancient glacier deposits. And those ancient glacier deposits are found in places that aren't cold enough to support glaciers currently. Now, one of the questions that Wegener started asking was, if there's evidence of glaciers being there, does that mean maybe at one point there were glaciers there? I think it probably does. Hmm. What should the students be writing down from this section? So one of the main ideas that you want to start thinking about is that we have glacial evidence in areas where we have no glaciers currently. Okay? So there's rocks that are found around glaciers in places where there are no glaciers. So that's kind of like what we just saw with the fossils, where there were fossils 
that are found in areas where they couldn't currently live. Absolutely. Now we have glacier deposits found in places where glaciers currently would not be found. Let's see what other evidence we have. Okay, so if we look at the map all the way up in the right hand corner, we have got a couple different rock layers. Now, if we look at the rock layers, we have a certain pattern that's present down here in Antarctica. And we actually have the same pattern of rock layers that's found up in Africa. We've also got the same pattern that we're seeing in Australia, and it's the same pattern of rocks that we see in India. I'm a Sawad, why would all those rocks be in the same layers, in the same patterns, but in different spots around the Earth? Well, I think you might suggest that if those rocks are actually the same rocks, the rocks that are in Africa are the same as the rocks in South America, that perhaps in the past, those two land masses were connected up and the rocks were actually formed at the same time because those two land masses were actually linked together. Is that what we're seeing here in this picture? So in this picture, a little bit different than that picture, we've got a map of something called Pangaea. Now this is Wegener's idea of the way the continents might have been connected to each other in the past. So you can see that South America fits very nicely in with Africa. And Antarctica fits in against what is now the southeastern coast of Africa. India is not connected to Asia at all. And Australia is connected to Antarctica and India. So wow, India really had to move a lot in order to get to its current position. Now to the north, North America sandwiches Greenland in the middle and Europe and Asia are connected together. So we have this big landmass called Pangaea. I think it's important, students, for you to write that down. How do you spell Pangaea, Mr. Baldwin? Okay, so this one's a tough one. It doesn't look like most words we usually see. So Pangaea is spelled P-A-N. I always get this messed up. Is it G-E-A or is it A-E-A? -E I like to spell it P-A-N-G-A-E-A, -E -A, okay. but I think that's kind of the old school way to do it. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot more on this picture that we can talk about. We can talk about the ice-rafted boulders. So when I talk about ice, I think that's some of the glacier material. We can talk about other rock deposits. We can talk about coal, sand dune deposits. Lots of evidence that Alfred Wegener had to support his idea that the continents were in fact connected up as Pangaea. So let's recap a little bit. We talked about four pieces of evidence that we have here. First, we looked at those fossils, the glossopterus. Okay, yeah. we found those on all kinds of different uh, continents. Then we saw the glacial deposits, so that was the second one. And then the third one, we saw were these patterns of rock layers. We saw the same patterns across all, most all the continents. And then the final one, which is my favorite, it brings me back to my youth, uh, is that the pieces of the continents they look like puzzles. They kind of fit nicely together, where the shorelines line right up with each other. Ooh, good. What else should we be looking at here? Oh, you know who this guy is? This is Alfred Wegener. The man himself. The man himself. So Alfred Wegener was in fact a meteorologist. He wasn't really a geologist, although we do say meteorologists are types of geoscientists. And these are some pictures of Alfred Wegener out doing his field work. And it is Alfred Wegener who proposed this theory that is called the theory of continental drift because he thought the continents drifted around the globe. Now, but there was a problem he had. Yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense to me because continents are huge. How can you get a whole continent to move from one place to another? Alfred Wegener had no idea. He didn't really know why these continents were moving or how, but he had evidence that they were in fact moving. So a lot of times when he would give speeches, people would say, that's nice and all, makes sense, but how's it happening? He didn't really know. So what you're saying is he didn't know what was actually causing the continents to move. He didn't know what the mechanism was that was causing them to move. Absolutely. He lacked a mechanism for moving entire continents across the globe. So I think a really good thing for the students to write down here on this slide is 
Alfred Wagner really couldn't prove that continental drift was happening to his other friends and scientists because he didn't have a mechanism to show how the continents were moving, what was causing them to drift. You think they're ready for a mastery check, Mr. Baldwin? What do you guys think? You guys ready? Good. I think you guys got this. Let's go see the mastery check. All right. So what we're going to ask you to do is we're going to ask you to create a concept map that shows the connections between the theory of continental drift and Wegener's ideas. Now you'll remember the ideas. You want to list four of them, and you want to describe what continental drift is as you're making a concept map. Now, to make your concept map, you can either use a Google drawing or you can go to the website BubbleUs, B-U-B-B-L dot U-S. Or if you want to use some other digital format, go ahead and do that. And then you're going to upload your concept map to your ePortfolio Unit 2 page. Now, Good job. Now, can we put pictures and words on these concept maps? Is that something we should be doing? I think that would be a great idea. I think that's a wonderful idea. Okay. We'll see you in class tomorrow. Have a good one, guys.